I am the transgender daughter of an Orthodox Christian nun. <laughs> Okay, the transgender daughter of an ex-Orthodox Christian nun. It just sounds cooler when I say she is a nun instead of was a nun. Well, I wasn't raised Orthodox Christian. I began my very religious life as an evangelical in a Swedish covenant church. At nine, my parents and I consequentially uh, became Pentecostals who attended a four-square church in the San Fernando Valley. My parents joined a vineyard church after I moved out and joined the Navy. And a few years later, they became Orthodox Christians. My parents, you see, were always looking for that perfect Christianity. So perhaps it's no surprise that after my dad passed away in 2002, my mom became a nun for about a year and a half. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. I had a really, really late onset puberty. At 14, I had an awful revelation while I was mowing the, our backyard in Granada Hills, California. So butch, eh? <laughs> mowing the yard. Anyway, I realized in a humongous cut green grass smelling epiphany that I was growing the wrong body. I was going to have to shave my face. My voice was going to deepen. I'd have to conform to male gender expectations and do things like keep my hair short and play sports <laughs> and stuff like that. I wasn't going to get secondary female characteristics like boobs. I wouldn't get to shave my legs, experiment with makeup, and get to have a period that said maybe. <laughs> Just maybe. <laughs> I could have a child and be a mother. I should have seen this coming. At 12, when I entered junior high, as a seventh grader. My older brother, Dan, had to teach me how to carry my books like a boy, down at my waist instead of up at my chest. He also had to teach me how to walk from my shoulders instead of from my hips. How do I say this? When presenting as a male in my life, I didn't experience straight privilege because I've always been pretty femme. Maybe you know about male privilege. In my life, I experienced peaking and advancement in six and a half years into a 20-year naval career. I wasn't safe alone in dark spaces. I wasn't immune from sexual harassment. I did experience male privilege when I presented as male in my life, to be sure but to a lesser degree than most white males. I never had straight, straight privilege, even at 12, even at 14. Oh, and you know, at 14, I promptly talked myself in believing I was a teenage cross-dresser instead of a teenage girl. You know, because I was tr attracted to other teenage girls. And girls can't be attracted to other girls, right? <laughs> it's just not done. It's not the heteronormative thing to do, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, if you're a Pentecostal future transgender daughter of an Orthodox Christian nun, <laughs> <laughs> being trans, gay, lesbian, bisexual, no. Not only no, but go to hell no. <laughs> One can't be a fundamentalist Pentecostal Christian and not be straight and straight can be. At 19, I went to some reparative therapy to cure me of the trans. At 20, I had the demon of transitism cast out of me. <laughs> praise Jeebus. <laughs> yeah, praise Jeebus. 
I felt cured in the moment at 19 and for many years beyond that, sort of. But ex-trans therapy works awa as well as ex-gay therapy, which is to say it doesn't work well at all. <laughs> and if there was a demon of being trans, she wasn't in me. She was me. She is me. So I prayed to get rid of my desire to be a woman. Then I used drugs. Then I prayed again. Then I joined the Navy. <laughs> then as a sailor, I got drunk a lot. <laughs> then I sobered up, dated, and got married to a woman I loved and turned out to be a really, really awful person for me to be married to. <laughs> and before we split, we had three awesome children, one adopted and two by in vitro fertilization. I tried really, really hard to be the man I wasn't. Being a father and being called dad is the mis misgendering I own in love, in pain. I'll never get to be the mother I wanted at 14. My ex and I separated in 1996. I had 16 years at the Navy at that point. And you know what my ex told me when we split? You're more of a woman than I am. It was spewed out as a stabbing insult, meant to deeply wound me. But the thing is, it didn't wound me in a melancholy, sort of spiritless way, I knew she was right. And in that separating moment, I knew it was a real possibility I was gonna transition when I got out. I wanted that retirement check that that military retiree gets at 20 years though. And I knew I was gonna suffer to achieve that. I knew about stigma. I knew I wanted to have a way to pay for child support if I lost my ability to have a job. So I wanted to make it to 20 years, only four years from 16 to 20. You know, male privilege includes not being likely to face sexual harassment at work unless you don't have straight privilege like I didn't. I actually have a don't ask, don't tell story you can read about it on Wikipedia that involves sexual harassment. You see, eight months before I was scheduled to retire, I was sexually harassed in the military by a subordinate and my ship's executive officer. Together, they tried to get me kicked out of the Navy because they thought I was a gay male when gay males weren't allowed to serve. My gender expression, it seems, was too femme. And in their minds, being femme meant that I obviously must be gay. I'm fierce femme, though. <laughs> I turned it around. Those two ended up getting negative administrative actions taken against them for sexually harassing me. <laughs> and it was documented in their military records. Yeah. <laughs> Don't. Fuck. With. Me. <laughs> and hey, I made it those last four years. And in those last four years, the Navy doctors determined I was bipolar. <laughs> Long story short, I have a military retirement that my ex-wife gets a third of. I have a 100% VA disability rating. And the Social Security Administration considers me disabled. So I'm one of 60,000 former service members in the country that triple dips that way. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, thank you taxpayers. <laughs> so no more long story short, my health care comes from the VA. In early 2002, I went to 
the psychiatrist I was assigned to, and in my absolute first session said, I have gender issues that I need to work out with a therapist. Dr. Smith, I wonder now if his first name was John, <laughs> was surprised at my frankness, frankness, complimented me for how brave I was, and then said, of course. <laughs> I was surprised. By the way, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of being told how brave I am for transitioning. I'm really, really brave for other things I've done as an activist and likely will do in the future, in this coming year, as an activist, but not for transitioning. <laughs> transitioning survival. If I hadn't transitioned, I would have eventually committed suicide. Anywho, at 44, I had a similar epiphany to the one I had to the smell of backyard grass at 14. This epiphany smelled like the sterile hallways of the VA La Jolla building. This time I realized I didn't have the wrong body. Well, how could it be? It's my body. I had some wanted and unwanted physical characteristics. I still needed those boobs. I needed none of that heavy, dark facial hair. And, well, basically, I needed a bit of tweaking. So drugs. <laughs> I needed some drugs, man. <laughs> there was no bureaucratic robot nearby, flailing, wailing, danger, Will Robinson, danger, <laughs> to impede Dr. Smith from getting me the appropriate medical treatment for my gender dysphoria. So the good doctor forwarded me along to one of those VA endocrinologists who was gonna hook me up with some of those horse pee derived estrogen called Premarin. Can I hear a woo hoo? <laughs> and then I learned all about this word called gatekeeping. My endo decided I didn't quote unquote look like a transsexual. If I wanted that horse pee estrogen, it was gender performance time. So as a work study at the patient health library at the VA Medical Center La Jolla in February 2003, I came dressed as Autumn Sandine with a name tag that said Steven Sandine <laughs> in blouses and dresses and heavy makeup that needed removing every three to four hours for a reshave because my heavy dark beard grew ever so rapidly, and then I had to take pictures of me performing gender and load them up to a photo, photo bucket style website so I could show that endo a link to a website that said I was performing gender in a I want those horse pee estrogen pills kind of trans woman. <laughs> I had two and a half months of performing gender to conform to societal gender norms to make my endocrinologist happy enough to give me those horse pee pills. Awesome. After 44 years of performing, I got to swallow those pills. I finally got to grow boobs. And the VA sent me to six voice lessons to fine tune the pitch of my voice. Thank you, taxpayers. <laughs> and out of pocket, I spent about $1,500 removing my dark beard hairs, which took about two years. It was worth it. It was really good for my self-comfort. So it was worth the investment. <sighs> Remember those two inglorious friends of Mrs. Happy? In 2011, I got rid of those um, bad boys. <laughs> Mrs. Happy has kind of lost her will to do anything in the process. But eh, what do you do? And hey, you all remember my mom, the ex-Orthodox Christian nun? Well, she and I no longer speak. 
When I changed my birth certificate to say female after I lost Mrs. Happy's two no good inglorious friends, she took that opportunity she'll never consider me her daughter. What timing. She dashed my pinnacle moment to create a chasm. But I know who I am in my heart. I know that my gender, my sex, is female. And oddly, I'm comfortable with my body now, even with Mrs. Happy still being there. It's a female body that I have because, well, I'm female here. <laughs> and to those of you who might think otherwise, Fuck you <laughs> and everybody who looks like you.